A very warm welcome to you. I'm Gavin Kelly, the Executive Chair of the Resolution Foundation, uh, and welcome to tonight's event, which we are hosting jointly with our friends from Fraser Valander Institute. Uh, and it is called Ending Stagnation. Um, and this is, for us, a chance to talk about a major piece of work that we at the Resolution Foundation have undertaken uh, jointly, I should say, with our friends at the London School of Economics and kindly funded by the Nuffield Foundation, which I should always say. Uh, over the last three years, um, we have produced 70-odd reports, God help us, on all sorts of questions of economic and social policy, which culminate in this book. Uh, and uh, none of you are allowed to leave without taking a copy of this book, obviously because it's an excellent piece of work and that you all need to read, but also um, we really don't want to be lugging it the rest of them back to, to London. So please do take them with you uh, and, and give them a read. Um, this, we launched this report, which tries to bring together all of these, this sort of wide range of thinking we've done across economic and social policy and tries to sort of forge it into what we sort of slightly grandly call an economic strategy, which is sort of fit for the, the decade uh, ahead and more. Um, we launched that at the turn of the year. We had uh, Keir Starmer and Jeremy Hunt and uh, all sorts of other assorted economic uh, great and good uh, from across the, the nations and regions of, of the UK down in London and then since then we've been on a we've done a kind of road trip uh, and I think this is the this is the tenth event we've done outside London over the last few months uh, and it's the final leg of the tour uh, so uh, we are pleased we are pleased to be doing that who needs who needs the barons when you've got the University of Strathclyde as your uh, as your final as your final gig. Um, and uh, I guess a goal when in doing this, I mean, we had lots of goals in doing this, but one of them, in, to put it in a very contemporary way, it was to get away from the sort of discussion we've been having on economics and fiscal policy and much else in the election campaign so far, which has basically been an exercise in throwing around dodgy dossiers, short-term outlook, uh, superficial takes on where the country's really at and a desperate avoidance of any real trade-offs um, so it's kind of really working for me I guess as a, as you can tell but it's like to try and get away from that and to, to sort of t look at a a much longer term uh, sort of take on where the country's really at and we started that because we are in a deep hole of low growth and high inequality and that feels like a sort of equilibrium we're stuck in uh, in the UK and have been for some time um, and we, our view was we needed a really hard-headed assessment of what we're good at and what we're bad at and kind of what our strengths and what our weaknesses are. And we have real, real strengths. And I actually came away from this process feeling really kind of quite optimistic about some of our strengths as well as deeply, deeply depressed about other things which we haven't been able to fix over most of the decades of my adult life. Um, so we had that view. We also had a kind of clear view that if you wanted to do something about it, you needed to sort of have an integrated approach which worked across you know, your future trade strategy, uh, your view of industrial strategy, your kind of how your view of fiscal sustainability, your view of the labor market and how that connects to a, a strengthened social security system and so on. You couldn't do it piecemeal. You had to try and pull it together. And that's what we attempt to do. I'm not saying we got it all right, but this is an attempt to pull the different threads of economic and social policy together in a kind of coherent way, which uh, for us felt like something that needed doing and it and it was an attempt to also grapple with trade-offs because there is just a desperate desperate sort of determination not to grapple with trade-offs in most debate on economic and social policy in this country in my view again i'm not saying we get that right but we, we definitely give it a go uh, read it and you can tell us um the final bit of context for me before i introduce our panel is that as you may have noticed um we're not from here we came up from uh from London, which is where the Resolution Foundation is based, but we take we really we take the question of devolution, obviously, to uh, the nations, particularly Scotland, but also Wales, Northern Ireland. We take that really seriously. We also take devolution to cities in England really seriously, and we try and work on that. Um, but the unit, the primary unit of analysis in this was was really the UK economy. This is not a report about the future of the, of the Scottish economy per se. It's about the future of the UK as a whole, and obviously Scotland is fundamentally important within that. But we are not the experts in Scotland. The other people on this panel are. So we speak with due humility on the, when it when it comes to that, uh, and, I, and it's important that I, I say that at the start. Um, we have got a great panel here tonight that you're going to hear from. Uh, we are going to hear first from my colleague, Charlie McGrady, 
on my right, uh, who's an economist at the Resolution Foundation, and he's going to distill the three years' work into 12 minutes, I think. Uh, so um, he'll miss out nothing at all. Uh, 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 so no pressure, Charlie. Um, uh, then we're going to hear from Mary Sparrett, who's the director of the Fraser Val Allender Institute, who I think just about everybody here will know, I'm sure. And you've done all sorts of things. You were the deputy chief exec of the Scottish Fiscal Commission uh, and much else besides. So we're, we're, we're grateful to, to ha have this event with you. Thank you. Then on my left, we have, um, again, I'm sure known to, to most people here, will be Anton Muscatelli, who is the, are you the vice chancellor? Or are you the, the vice chancellor? I was going to say, I don't know if it's principal or vice chancellor. It's both. It's both. There you go. <laughs> is the vice chancellor of uh, Glasgow University and has done lots of other things. And, and that doesn't seem to be much in sort of economic policy that you haven't done, but you were the chair of the First Minister's Standing Council in Europe and a, a member of the Scottish Government's Council of Economic Advisers and so on. And we have Patricia Finlay on the far left, who is the co-chair of Scotland's uh, Fair Work Convention, as well as being a professor here at Strathclyde University and director of the Scottish Centre for Employment Research. So we are really delighted to have you all. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we are in good hands. My job is really to try and keep them into some sort of time, uh, which we're going to do, because I'd really like to hear from you. I hope you're all going to take part and ask us questions. Uh, uh, so, and we'll try and release you to your evenings because I'm sure you've got things to do uh, at around seven. So that is the plan. And I'm going to hand over to you, Charlie. Yeah, pleasure to be here. So we've always happened to be in uh, Scotland. We have a bit of a canter through the Economy 2030 uh, inquiry to give them a flavour where Scotland sits in that. Um, obviously, all the experts, I'll leave most of that to, uh, to the panel. Um, but yeah, starting with problems. I promise to just get a bit more optimistic to go through the presentation. Um, so we're over a decade into, into stagnation. Um, it's had sort of a real slowdown in productivity since the mid-2000s. It's worth saying that not every country has experienced this. Um, the UK has fallen behind the likes of uh, US, uh, France uh, and Germany. And, you, know, you might say why does this matter? Why does it matter mid for me? Why does it matter for everyone? Uh, and the answer is that uh, weak productivity uh, affects the things we experience as paying uh, fire our wages. And what does the picture look like in, in Scotland? Um, in, the, in the olden days, um, wages were actually rise. Um, you can take the pre financial crisis trend and, and extrapolate that. Uh, CISA uh, wage in Scotland uh, would be around £11,200 higher if they continued uh, on that trend to the uh, big, big um, But it's not the only challenge the UK faces. We've been living with uh, stagnating wages for about 15 years. Uh, for the uh, long lasting uh, inequality uh, has been popping for about twice as long. And inequality sort of rose in the 1980s and has twice we stayed hard. In since then, if we take the stagnation in, in wages uh, with a, a high inequality, this leaves the UK both like poorer and, and more unequal than many of the other uh, countries that we think uh, similar to. And, and what this chart does is that it plots uh, inequality on the horizontal axes uh, and it comes uh, vertical axes. Uh, and basically, uh, if you get a picture of uh, at the top left in Switzerland, happy place um, with countries richer and more equal in the UK, uh, and the bottom right hand quadrant is a bit less uh, happy with the place that are poorer and less equal than the UK. Uh, and what does it look like if we actually plot uh, some countries? So, as you can see, the likes of uh, France, the Netherlands, Ireland, uh, Germany, um, all countries that we sort of roughly compare ourselves to in these happy quadrants with uh, you know, higher incomes and more equal than the UK. So this toxic combination, uh, as we phrased it, of, of stagnation and inequality means that the UK is a particularly bad place to be poor. Um, you know, incomes at the top um, are sort of broadly similar uh, in the UK compared to the likes of Germany, uh, Netherlands and France. Um, but at the bottom of the distribution, low-income households is about 50 <coughs> poorer 
uh, compared to their uh, comparators and did those captures. So it's a really bad place to be. That's really bad. It's pretty unsurprising then um, that many people feel their local areas are heading in the wrong direction. Um, it's quite interesting that Scotland and London are a bit more optimistic than some other parts of the country. So faced with the toxic combination of low growth and high inequality, UK is in need uh, of a proper serious economic strategy. We're going to take you through getting to that, but in, in short, um, we basically need to get serious about growth. Uh, we also need to be as hard hit about reducing inequality. So starting with, with growth, we need to base our, our economic strategy from the nature of what our economy uh, actually is, um, not the economy we'd like to think it was, and, and not trying to think it was going to overnight become uh, somewhere like Germany. So starting with um, a reason to be optimistic, the UK really is a, a services superpower, and, and that's the likes of this traditional financial sector, but also universities standing at a, a, um, uh, a great university today. We really do, we really do well at our kind of services. Okay. But we also need to be realistic about the rest of our economy. It's not that we shouldn't care about the likes of, of manufacturing. Um, you know, it's likely to remain a really important half of the economies in some areas of the UK. Um, but it basically doesn't have the capacity to create a large number of new high quality uh, jobs, which are really the ones that are going to be the includes productivity okay. as a whole. I should also note that we've got a big trade agenda as part of the economy transparency inquiries, um, which includes new service deals for the likes of have Australia, Canada and Japan. Where the weakness lies the UK is in its service economy. And now I did pause um, before including the title, so we'll see how it calls welcome. Um, but the fact remains that uh, the UK is far too few of our city than the like successful service economies. And like this Scottish story is maybe uh, a bit more positive um, than the English story we tell about lagging uh, behind cities, Birmingham uh, and uh, Manchester, uh, where you know, Edinburgh stands out. Um, quite a positive story and in Glasgow too has seen um, some uh, catch up. But for the UK as a whole, um, the story really is you know, we have to catch up with. With France, it's going to require a big boost to the performance of large cities outside London. So we need an economic strategy uh, that boots <coughs> UK cities, um, but also prioritises its strength and services. Um, getting serious about growth uh, also means getting serious about um, investment. We've consistently been the lowest um, uh, advanced country in uh, investment over the last four decades. This shows up everywhere, from crumbling school buildings, fewer hospital beds per person, uh, poor water quality in our rivers, uh, fewer MRI scanners in our hospitals. And it's true from both a public uh, and a private perspective. Um, in terms of business, um, we've got really, really inefficient uh, planning systems uh, that make it all incredibly expensive. Uh, from a public perspective, um, we often choose to cut um, their investment budgets when a government budget is being squeezed in, so there's a sort of really volatile nature of public investment. One major area that's going to require significant uh, investment over the coming years is net zero. I think the best way of, of thinking about this is uh, invest now. Um, save later, so it's going to require a significant amount of investment, uh, about 50 billion a year by 2013, um, but by 24 it's either save or outweigh the costs. And it's also worth proving to the the next phase in transition uh, is going to require a significant amount of everyday improvements to the efficiency of um, our cars and our homes, and we need to be realistic about and can and can't cover the costs of things like and be proving the efficiency of our leaky homes. So I've talked about growth, um, but what does a serious economic strategy look like when it comes to inequality? One of the most blindingly obvious aspects is we need a stronger safety net. 
Social Security in the UK has actually gone backwards in recent years. Um, unemployed benefits have come less generous um, uh, compared to average earnings. We make a, a series of recommendations uh, within uh, the report, including benefits should be operated in line with wages, not prices. Um, and unemployed benefits should be limited to pay after job loss. How does Scotland look on, on other measures of, of inequality? Um, Scotland generally has lower levels of child poverty than the UK, um, and the Scottish Government has made really clear, ambitious goals to reduce child poverty. But as you can see from the chart, um, big changes would still be needed to reach that uh, 2030 child poverty target. Another area where we've made really big progress over recent decades, and definitely should un un underestimate and sort of understate just how much progress has been made, is on the minimum wage. Um, minimum wage policy has totally transformed the nature of earnings growth. But we shouldn't stop there. Um, we need a good work agenda that goes beyond the minimum wage. Pay isn't the only thing that matters um, at work. And we've seen really large falls in satisfaction particularly for the lowest paid workers. Um, there's lots of detail on good work and fair work that I'm sure um, Patricia will pick up on. Um, but one of our proposals um, is what we've called uh, a good work agreement in, in some centres with really kind of knotty uh, issues. I guess these are a bit like the, the fair pay agreements um, that are in New Zealand. Um, we suggested that social care would be a really good place to start, uh, driving up minimum standards on things like progression. Um, we've also noted that uh, we think about the warehousing and cleaning the, the sectors too. Um, I should say, yeah, there's a huge amount uh, in the almost 300 page report that I haven't covered um, despite my best efforts, um, including on a big tax reform agenda, lots of detail on a net zero and how to boost um, business diamonds. Um, so taking a step back, where does all leave up, leave us? Um, the, what should we do about this and, um, and is there a significant prize at, at stake? The answer is there is and, and there's lots of uh, potential for catch up. And I'll return to a chart I showed um, at the beginning. Um, to, if we manage to close the uh, income and inequality gaps um, with the likes of Australia, Canada, France and Germany and the Netherlands, um, countries we generally compare ourselves to, the specifically chosen countries that are not even the, the most equal or, or, or the richest countries in, in the world, so it feels like an achievable target. But the effect of that um, would lead to a boost in income of around 25% or, or around uh, £8,300 better off. So, there's clearly a really big challenge ahead, um, but a lot to play for. Hopefully, reasons to be um, optimistic. Uh, and on that note, I'll pass you over to Gavin and the rest of the panel. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. <laughs> the, um, so it's bleak to have fallen so far behind countries that we like to think of as being kind of quite like us. Uh, if there's a silver lining, which I think there is a bit of a silver, a, a tiny, tiny one, if you really search for it, is that having fallen so far behind, you don't have to be a world leader. You don't have to be kind of best on the planet, uh, any of this stuff, to actually catch up quite a bit. You don't have to be at the vanguard of productivity to actually just catch up a fair bit with people who are in many ways not so dissimilar to us and are not much more educated than us and so on. We've just made some really, really bad choices on some really important things. Uh, and to some degree, that should be reversible. So that, that's, uh, that's me trying to get the glass back to half full. Mary, how do you sit? Oh, well, since um, this was published six months ago, yeah, six months. Um, Feels like a I, was, I was at the launch, which was very exciting. Everyone was very excited when Keir Starmer was speaking, especially. Um, I've been thinking about the relevance of this document in the Scottish context. Um, we're not without economic strategies in Scotland. Uh, the government likes to produce lots and lots of strategy documents. Um, I think one of the issues that we often have with them, and we've written this many times, is that um, you know, do they really provide a framework for considering real trade-offs and sort of driving activity? Um, you know, everybody, I would presume, wants to see a prosperous, fair, and green Scotland. Um, you know, great. 
but it's, you know, what are the choices we're going to make to try and achieve that? What are we going to focus on? What are we not going to do as well as what we are going to do? Um, and so um, being honest, I was a little depressed by the first use of this by the Scottish Government. And I apologise some colleagues in the room uh, who are here from the Scottish Government um, to sort of take that 8,300 figure and turn it into a figure which was comparing Scotland to some independent successful countries it likes to think it could emulate if it became independent. <coughs> and I felt that that was the wrong message to take from this report for Scotland. Um, instead of thinking about um, you know, how could we devise an economic strategy which recognised the strengths of the Scottish economy and set a framework within which decisions could be made to achieve a more successful um, economy. But we're in the situation in Scotland, there's obviously new leadership um, uh, in John Swinney and Kate Forbes, who took over only a couple of weeks before the election was called. Um, and they certainly were making noises. And in the, the speech that John Swinney gave, I don't know how many of you were there, mm. um, at, at, um, at Barclays, uh, the week before the election was called, was very much saying, you know, I want to say this is going to be a change. Scotland's open for business. We want to work with businesses. We want to see growth in Scotland. That is going to be our focus. And so uh, all of us were waiting to see, well, that sounds really positive. Let's see what's produced next. And obviously, since the election was called, um, it's a bit of a shame because they've not been able to say what they're going to do differently or, or what their policy agenda will be um, because they're not able to during the election period. So we're still sort of waiting. So it's kind of a quite a difficult position for, uh, for the Scottish government to be in, um, to be honest. Um, but a lot of the things in the report do chime with um, some of the, I suppose, the issues we see in the Scottish economy as well. Um, low investment. Um, business investment in the UK isn't great, and Scotland is even worse. So that's a that's a problem, um, and it's been lagging the UK for as long as there's been data to measure um, to measure business investment in Scotland. There is also a bit of a data issue with measuring business investment pro properly, mm -hmm. um, which I'll not get into unless anyone wants me to. <laughs> but that also it, it does hold back policymakers really understanding what's going on with business investment. Yeah. I mean, it does you know if we can't see it and we can't see the differences in business investment in different parts of the UK, it does make it more challenging. Um, we do very well on research and development, which is linked to universities, and um, we have excellent universities in Scotland. But it doesn't always translate into research and development by business. And there is this sort of, how do we translate that excellence in research into excellence in innovation in the, um, the private sector? And some of these things are well kent in Scotland, you know, particularly the challenge around scaling up businesses. So lots of innovations. How do we then turn them into successful businesses that don't feel like they have to leave Scotland in order to grow or to make that next step? And you know, being being honest in terms of the last um, uh, administration, um, there are some interventions in the economy that have made some investors nervous, um, particularly in the property sector. Now, others may disagree, but I think there's lots of evidence that that has been the case. Um, and those are particular Scottish issues, which we'll have to see how they unwind under the new um, administration. The inequalities that are present in the UK are also present in Scotland. You know, if you exclude the very maddest bits of London <laughs> from it, you know, the inequalities in the UK and in Scotland are pretty similar, to be yeah, honest. You know, um, and you look at um, areas like Edinburgh compared to the rest of Scotland, um, you know, you do see quite large inequalities in Scotland. Um, and we have an additional challenge maybe to look at England, where so much of our country is, is rural and much further from centres of population than, than <coughs> in England. Um, you know, what that means for an economic strategy to ensure that everybody can flourish is more challenging. Um, I think thinking about decarbonisation, um, and we've written a lot about this in the last couple of days, um, you know, it's a huge opportunity for the UK to be a global leader potentially, um, but it also has the um, potential to, you know, maybe threaten some communities, some industrial sectors, and the communities that rely on them. All of that is completely magnified hugely in Scotland because we have so many of the resources potentially, so many of the opportunities, 
but also the threats to some communities in Scotland is, is that a bit more magnified, particularly in the northeast of Scotland. Um, so I think something that really chimed with me when I read the report was the point about us being a services superpower in the UK. <coughs> And I've often said um, in recent months that we need to be realistic um, about what sorts of supply chains and what sorts of economic opportunities we actually have for from decarbonisation in Scotland. Um, you know, people forget sometimes that um, services isn't just about financial services or even about hospitality, tourism. It's also about engineering. Um, um, for professional and business services to support um, uh, developments, planning, um, environmental assessment. All of these things we are really have a real comparative advantage with in Scotland and we should build on those. Um, it's important to know how to uh, install and build things as well as make um, bits of kit. So we have a real opportunity in those areas in Scotland to make the most of the, the energy transition. While some of the challenges are the same, some of them are different. Our population's ageing more quickly in yeah. Scotland. There, there are big areas of Scotland who have real issue around depopulation. You know, we're not worried about too many people in many areas of Scotland. Uh, but overall, I'd say there's an interesting role for research here. There are some different approaches being taken in Scotland or in different countries in the UK from others. And there's an interesting question there about what we can learn from the different approaches being taken in different countries in the UK. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Mary. Uh, lo lots I want to pick up on, but I'm going to resist the temptation and pass straight on uh, to Anton in the interest of time. Over to you. Thanks, Gavin, and, and very grateful to Resolution Foundation and to the Fraser Valander Institute for inviting me along. Um, I think we're in danger of violently agreeing with each other, so we I'll might find, well I'll find something to uh, spice it up. Yeah. Um, I should say that uh, I with the University of Glasgow have been involved with uh, a, a, another uh, sort of project called the Productivity Institute which has been funded by the uh, UKRI which actually is highly complementary to the work that's uh, that's been done by the Resident Foundation. Again looking at uh, particularly focusing on productivity and growth and um, perhaps with less of a focus around the, the sort of superpower uh, potential in areas like services, but looking essentially at the same problem and uh, less at the inequality issues directly, except in how they impact on productivity growth. Um, and so this is this is of particular interest to me. Uh, I think one of the interesting things for me is that uh, you know one of the big lessons that comes out both out of this report, but also out of the Productivity Institute's uh, report, is that this is a complex problem. If you really want to turn around growth in the UK. You're not going to solve it uh, in a single way. And, and actually, Charlie and Mary have already touched on a number of these things. Uh, and, and I won't repeat the, the issues around second tier cities, around um, you know, better infrastructure, investment in net zero. Uh, let me just perhaps mention a couple of things that haven't been uh, surfaced yet. One of the problems in the UK is also the diffusion of best practice and the diffusion of, of, of technology, but also um, you know, management best practice. We know that a lot of the lagging in productivity is not in the day top firms in many sectors, but it happens between the median firm and, and the sort of the one of the 90 90th percentile. So, so again, you know, it's a complex problem. I wish it was as simple as a single sector or a single set of firms we could do something about it. Yeah. Now, what are we going to do about it? Uh, one of the points uh, about the relationship between the UK and Scotland that I want to cover, uh, and it might be worthwhile discussing, is to what extent, if you're going to have a productivity enhancement strategy, a growth strategy, to what, wh where does it happen at different levels of government? Um, and I'm, I'm going to be a big advocate for a, a more integrated strategy here across the UK with the regions and the devolved authorities. Why? Because it's a complex problem. And you have seen certainly in, in, in not only in what the Productivity Institute has said, but also Resolution Foundation, you really are going to have to join up different parts of government to make this happen. So, you know, one of the pieces, uh, a piece I wrote just yesterday in the Herald talked about, you know, trying to create a bit more of an economy type ministry at UK level. Uh, that's been talked about elsewhere. Uh, you could do it through an executive uh, cabinet committee. You could do it by... You know, as Rachel Reeves mentioned, uh, you know, boosting the growth unit within the Treasury, all, all sorts of ideas. But the point is, you need to join up different types, different actions, because as we saw with some of the levelling up 
uh, strategies under the current government, you can throw m money at small projects, but you will then hit other other problems, whether it's planning or whether it's oh, there isn't enough public infrastructure to deal with this. You know, uh, I was in a meeting, for instance, with with uh, leaders in, in Edinburgh saying, well, it's all very well saying we're going to do more, you know, bring some levelling up funding here. But the reality is, unless you're going to build up the infrastructure, the schools, etc., you're not going to be able to bring the workers yeah. Yeah. in to, to, to create to create that 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 rocket fuel. Yeah. So, and, and certainly in second tier cities, we face the, these kind of issues. So, uh, then the question is, you know, there are issues around devolution. We've we created a devolution structure in the UK, which is not like all other federal structures, but basically devolved certain functions and kept some reserve. Now that's fine, you know, that can work, but there needs to be cooperation because this is going to be involve multiple areas of spend. And it, this isn't going to work unless you strengthen those, those, those institutions that bring collaboration across <coughs> the, the regions and nations. So how will that be done? And I think that's a big issue for an incoming UK yeah. government. You know, We've, we've seen how joint ministerial committees work during Brexit, but they didn't work during Brexit. So we need to find ways of making that work. Um, other points uh, quickly, because I realise that uh, I've, got to, I've got to stick to time. I, I, I do think there needs to be, if, if there are going to be strategies that are going to be developed at Scottish level, and as Mary said, we've had a few. Uh, I was involved in the initial advisory board around the creation of NSET, the National Strategy for Economic Transformation, as were many others, um, and probably others in, in the room. Um, and I think, you know, again, we had hope that that might lead to joining up of spend across different areas of, 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 of government, it's called. But it hasn't. It's led to action plan. This is highly complex. And again, uh, as Mary uh, was, I was in that um, uh, event at Barclays with John Swinney and, and Kate Forbes. And I really do hope, in a sense, they're planning to energize that and move away from a complex tick box exercise into something which actually says, let's join up levels of spending around economic uh, development and productivity growth. So I also, for instance, wrote a, uh, uh, um, a report for Scottish Government in 2019 around uh, trying to create uh, more impact from innovation, research and innovation, based on what's happening in universities. Uh, and some of that involves you know, more joining up, more collaboration between universities, more collaboration with universities and businesses. And some of that hasn't really been translated in, into action. So I think quite a lot to do, but I think there needs to be collaboration between uh, the UK and the, devolved, the UK government and the devolved nations. Quick points are on trade-offs. Trade-offs are important. I mean, Mary's mentioned them in the context of economic strategies. Um, both parties have locked themselves into some very tight fiscal rules. Um, so whoever wins the election at UK level is going to face some difficult choices. If Labour wins, it seems likely, they're going to, and, and they're going to stick to the existing fiscal rules, it will leave very little room for manoeuvre in terms of some of these big infrastructure investments. So that's a big debate to be had. Um, around, I mean, I, I all, I, again, something I said yesterday in that Herald piece, we really do need to have a grown-up debate in this, in this election around taxes and spending, because um, everybody, this, there seems to be a vow of silence around all of this, and, 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 and it can't be that, because if you're going to do some of the things in this report or in the Productivity Institute report, it requires a, a grown-up debate about that, and, and I'm afraid we're not having it at the moment during this election campaign. Um, the UK does have areas where it could make taxation, uh, where it could improve the tax base and make it more progressive to deal with some of the inequality issues. Um, um, some of you will have read Paul Johnson's book, Money Matters. You know, some of these things are, are, are clearly set out there. You could be more progressive about property taxes. You could have land value taxes. You could do, and that's touched on, I know, in the Resolution Foundation's work. You could have a, most other European countries have a much broader base for VAT. VAT is regressive, but if you increase the base and then compensate those who lose, you can make it, actually yeah. make it work. You can bring in billions. So th there are answers out there. If you want to fund public services and public infrastructure, we need to have a grown up debate. Now, maybe we don't want to go there as a country, but then we need to be honest about which public services are we going to cut? Because again, the IFS has been very clear about this. If on the current plans, uh, which is, are the ones that even an incoming Labour government would in inherit, you could easily end up 
with uh, unprotected departments being cut by about three and a half percent in, in real terms. That, and that's a serious, uh, no, that's not going to help your inequality stats. So look, I'll, I'll stop there. I think there's some really interesting questions here. I think, it's a, I think we are, we've diagnosed the problem well. Uh, this report, many other reports have, actually, I think, diagnosed the problem well. The question is, is there the will to do something about it? And it's putting the machinery of government into place to make it work. And again, I think, I think we all agree about what we have to do around that in terms of the machinery in Whitehall and the connectivity with the regions uh, in England, but also with the devolved nations. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Patricia, over to you. Uh, okay, I thought I'd maybe just pick up on something that, that Anton said at the end there about actually the devil and I think we all agree on the, a lot of the analysis and the recommendations in the report but the devil will be in the detail of how we actually get about implementing it. And I think that's, as Charlie said earlier, we're talking about a number of problems which are of, of significant long-standing, some that, are, that have emerged over the last decade or decade and a half and some that are, that are maybe just around the corner in, in terms of some things like technology and some aspects of demographics and AI. I kind of read the report very much around the issue of work and workplaces in the labour market, because that's what I'm especially interested in. I won't use the term good work, because we're in Scotland, so we use the term fair work. Um, I'm sticking to that just because we're here. But also, but also, I guess, because we've been at it for quite a long time. Um, we've had a longer commitment to fair work in Scotland, and I think we might be in a position where some of the things that we've wanted to do and wanted to try have been much more challenging than we perhaps wanted them to be. So one of the ways in which I was reading the report was thinking, OK, if we do that, what's the, what's the practicalities? How do we actually, do, actually deliver that? It's quite easy to talk about things like employment regulation and say, well, we could do X or Y. Some of those things are very important and we should do them. Um, some of the other stuff about what goes on in workplaces and what delivers fair work and what fair work actually is are much less amenable to regulation mm -hmm. as a lever for policymakers. So I've become really interested over the last sort of few years about the, the kind of how do we make these things happen even if we have a political will. And we have had a strong political commitment in Scotland for eight or nine years now to fair work and a, and a policy narrative incorporated in an earlier programme for government around this idea of inclusive growth, that that's what we needed to be delivering. So that's, there's been far less, I think, um, contesting of that as a notion. Whether or not we've got the emphasis on inclusive growth right and the role of things like good or fair work in inclusive growth, I'm not, I'm not sure and I will, I will come on to talk about that in a minute. I thought what was very good about the report was this idea that we, we are going to have to tackle the, the, the challenges that we face holistically. So I'm, as I said, very interested in, in work and workplaces and what happens in the labour market. But actually, a lot of that it can only be changed in conjunction with other policy domains and systems. So I've done some work recently with hospitality employers. And, and hospitality is a very low-paying industry. It has real fair work challenges. But one of the real challenges they face in attracting and retaining labour is what's happening with migration, mm -hmm. what's happening with housing, they can't get affordable housing for their staff, what's happening with transport and other infrastructure, what is childcare like. And those things are particularly challenging in rural communities yeah. in Scotland, are particularly challenging um, particu in island communities. So you've got this idea that we need to look at an integrated landscape. Um, welfare is the other obvious area. So we might we have employability powers in Scotland. Those are devolved. But actually, some of the things you want to do around employability, if, if your objective which was to drive fair work, comes very quickly up against the challenges of the welfare system. Yeah. Um, and so, so some of the things that you might want to do to be very ambitious um, are constrained by what is a reserved power, a reserved power on welfare. So that idea of kind of trying to look at these things holistically and thinking about the different policy domains, I think, is really important. I really like the, the focus in the report on looking at the bottom and the middle. There's always a real temptation to focus on the bottom. And in the, when we set up the convention in the framework a long time ago, we actually made a, dis, a specific and explicit decision that we would look across the labour market. Because not, not to, to underestimate the challenges faced at people at the bottom of the labour market, but actually to recognise that there are fair work issues across occupations at every level. But also, if you don't do something about the middle, you can't do anything about the bottom. 
So if, again, if we look at some sectors where we've got a concentration of low pay, people don't take the opportunities, limited though they are, to earn more money by taking more senior positions, because actually those more senior positions are not significantly different from their own. Um, you know, they get a few more, a, a little bit more pay for a whole load of stress and responsibilities. So the middle is important for the people in the middle. The middle is also really important for the place where, where yeah. people at the bottom might go. So that's really important. Um, one of the things I really would stress, and I don't think we've, we've ever really got it right in Scotland, although I have been banging on about it for years. We talk about fair work, I think, often as being an inclusion measure. So it's about addressing inequality. And I, and I thought the report did a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. I really like the idea and have always been committed and think the evidence is strong on the idea of fair work as a driver of productivity. Um, so I think fair work delivers growth as well as inclusion. It gives, uh, as, you, as you say in the report, empowered workers the opportunity to make a difference. It, it supports innovation. It allows people to use their skills. It engages people in their workplaces. It, it allows them to develop solutions. So I think there's a need to reframe a debate around growth and inclusion, which sees fair work, good work in England, as a, as a major driver of that. It's really important, and you, you point it out in the, in, in the report, not to rely on sort of single silver bullets. We know how important the national minimum wage was. Um, we know that the real living wage has been incredibly important to people who get it. There's a really strong interest by policymakers in having single issue measures or single interventions. They're, they're kind of easy to explain. Um, no disrespect to policymakers. They're easy to explain and they're often easier to count. But they don't deal with this sort of multi-dimensional notion that fair work is. It doesn't deal, for example, with what Charlie was saying about job satisfaction. So these measures are important, but often they interact poorly with other measures they may engage in. So that's an area where I think we yeah. need to be very careful. I think we need to be very careful around um, in the future. We're at, we're at an interesting place. So quite a lot of what we've done in Scotland has been to try and make up for the fact or be creative around the fact that we don't have employment law powers. So what can we do on a sort of voluntary basis? I think there's two important dimensions of that, which I, I think we should stress for where we go in the future. So on the one hand, yes, we need a much better suite of individual and collective employment rights. We, they're well outlined in the report. There are lots of areas where we know individual employment rights aren't strong enough. Um, and we also know that the reliance on individuals to pursue their employment rights in what is an extremely challenging context of employment tribunals is a huge disincentive to people actually relying on the rights that they already have. And a right that you can't enforce is a pretty useless right. We also know that the issue around collective employment rights in, in the UK is, is, is pretty weak. We, we breach international rights le le legislation. Um, we don't deal with some of the issues that we should do through c c promoting constructive facility of collective um, labour engagement. What we do is we, what we've seen in the last few years is a huge constraint on that. So I think there's a lot to be done in that space. But I think we need to think about the limits of regulation and, and the areas that it doesn't reach. And I guess that takes me to, to what I'm assuming is my final point, because I've just been given a one-minute reminder. Very politely. One of, the, one of the things I think, we do it a lot in Scotland, maybe more than the rest of the UK, because I think we're, people might disagree with, with me, I think we're quite statist in Scotland. We're quite comfortable with the idea that the state should do things, perhaps less so than, than other parts of the UK. But part of the consequence of that is I think we quite often think the state can fix things it can't. So, so in a whole lot of areas, and in particular in relation to fair work, the state policymakers and government are not the key actors. The architects of fair work are employers. So, what what are the measures that policymakers can take that engage employers, that encourage employers, that support them to have a different orientation, for example, towards empowered workforces or workers on boards? What can we do with employers in order to deal with issues of capability and capacity to engage in delivering better, more inclusive, fairer workplaces? Mm -hmm. Some of that stuff isn't dealt with by any discussion around legislation, but it, it does require thinking about things like in, you know, coordination across employers, how employers are trained, or how managers are trained and supported. So there's a whole host of things which 
are, are not capable of being delivered by policymakers, but in which policymakers have a, have a key role in trying to facilitate the, the narrative, the orientation, the dialogue, which would allow us to move, I guess, as the, as the report makes clear, in the direction of those countries that have a stronger social partnership orientation where we can use collective endeavour to solve what are an, an undoubtedly really tricky and intractable set of challenges. That's all. Brilliant. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I, I think it's in, coming here from, like, from London, it's kind of interesting that so much of the policy discussion currently, because there's an anticipation of a new government with a different approach to many of the issues you've been talking about, there's a, I think a lot of people's minds are in the kind of, let's pass lots of laws. Mm. Uh, and a lot of those laws are laws that I desperately want to see passed, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not being too snippy about it. But they're not, there's not real engagement with the, okay, that's really important and that's a precondition in many ways for doing lots of stuff, but that's the easy bit and the really, really hard. It, do, it doesn't even get you 20% of where you want to get to. And that's not, and I, I think most people think it's going to get you to like 80 or 90% of where you want to get to, and it's not. And I think the debate in Scotland is really kind of instructive because it's been going on a lot longer on, on, on the issues you've been working on, Patricia, and I think people are going to kind of have to catch up quite quickly uh, uh, in Westminster on that. Now, I have lots of questions I was wanting to ask the panel, but um, I'm also cognizant of the time, and so I think I might... Like, uh, I've got lots of questions out there. Can, let's do this sort of deliberatively. Are people, yeah, okay, I think we should ignore my questions okay. with a heavy heart. Uh, maybe I'll try and squeeze them in and, and let's go direct to the audience because you've been good enough to turn up. Uh, so let's take, let's take a cluster of questions and if I can sneak mine in, I'll try to. I'm going to take, there's a lady with her hand up there and there's another, there's a gentleman on the same row and then there's another couple of questions after this. Yeah. So t t tell us who you are. Thank you. I'm Annie Miller. I'm a retired academic economist. Um, there's nothing being said uh, today which addresses the fact that we have 20% of the population in poverty and uh, 20 years of just upgrading benefits by inflation while growth goes on has led to an enormous gap. The benefit levels are about half what the OECD yeah. poverty benchmark would be and just upgrading them by growth now is not going to catch them up. And the government policy has actually made people ill. If they live in that poverty, they get ill, both physically and mentally, and has led to enormous demands on the health service, which I'm sure has been part of the contract. And what policies are you recommending to address this enormous policy? Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Yes. Hi there, I'm uh, Sandy from um, Scottish National Investment Bank um, and also um, with the Edinburgh Poverty Commission. So um, you, you've spoken a lot about where we are at right now and I think uh, people have spoken about the uh, choices that incoming governments face as well. When it comes to business investment, which I guess is where I'm kind of interested, and a lot of you have mentioned it, whether it terms, you know, businesses feeling able to invest in their workforce and fair work or feeling able to invest in R&D or innovation and technology, it, it feels to me like businesses are also not in a great position to do that right now after the past few years we've had. So um, I'm just wondering about potential solutions or initiatives that would make it more possible or, or um, appealing for businesses to invest in those kinds of things because they are such a big part of, of, of what we do. Okay, thank you. And then I think there were two more, and then we'll come back to the panel. Okay. Hi, my name is Adrian Armstrong. I'm a retired HR manager. Uh, you focused on growth uh, naturally, but I wonder how much attention have you paid to sustainability and perhaps the green agenda? Mm -hmm. um, when you talk about growth, you seem to be talking about the gross domestic product, but there are some other uh, yes. measures that we could be using, such as wellness. Or even if you have, for example, if we move to um, lower emissions in terms of how we produce our energy, we're told that will cost a lot less. My assumption then is that gross domestic product would go down. So lowering growth could be a good thing. I just wonder, what, have you paid enough attention to the um, requirements of sustainability? Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I'm Sally Redmondov uh, here. Um, I, I work with the Health and Social Care Alliance for the Third Sector 
uh, intermediary for a range of um, organisations working across health and social care. Um, and I, I'm, I'm wondering what thoughts you have about the, um, the extent to which the strategy needs to take account of the changing health yeah. dynamics in our um, you know, within the UK within you know across the, the nations um, because I'm very aware that um, you know you you look at the um, analyses around the uh, our health you know uh, the the the, the um, forecasts are that more people are going to be living in long-term conditions but also the analysis that you've described is also having an impact on people's health um, and so uh, it felt like maybe a kind of missing dimension um, somewhat in, in some of the analysis in the report. And if I can, it just also, I'm just also curious about what, I mean, if, from my observation, it feels like a sector of our economy that tends to get seriously overlooked is the, the third sector, the voluntary community sector, um, as, as I think is more typically kind of phrased within England. Um, in Scotland alone, there are over 40,000 organisations working within this sector, contributing across a whole range of um, aspects of, of social inclusion, social justice, health, social care. Um, but in terms of its contribution, from an economic point of view, it just seems to be severely lacking. And at worst, we seem to be actually doing it harm to our measures. So if I can sneak that question in too, sorry. Thank you. Right. Um, so I'm going to ask the panel to pick up on the questions they want to pick up on, and I'm going to ask them to do it in quite a pithy way. I'm going to take the liberty of answering the first, uh, there was, uh, I think, Annie's question on poverty, which was directly about what we're saying, and I'm going to do it very briefly. But we set out, there's a lot in here about uh, poverty and incomes towards the bottom. There's a lot directly on social security, and it would make a massive difference if we just got, we, we have to get rid of the two-child limit and we have to get rid of the benefit cap, in my view, otherwise we are just piling up levels of poverty. And Scotland is trying to mitigate that th through what it's been doing in relation to child poverty, but it's kind of running uphill. And then I won't, I'm, I'm doing a talk tomorrow, in fact, on what's the outlook for poverty across the UK. And I mean, it's, a, it's truly bleak. So that would make a massive difference. There is a big thing that we just, we have never in recent years uprated benefits with earnings for the working age population. We do it for pensioners and we don't do it for the working age population. Other, not all countries, but some other countries do that. In the long term, if we want to actually keep people who cannot, for good reason, who cannot earn most of their income from work, if they want to keep them up with the rest of society, then we need to make a decision about whether we're willing to do that. I think we should, over the long term, uprate working age benefits uh, with earnings. And that would, over a period of a decade and more, that would be transformative. Um, but it is also about things which are not to do with benefits. I mean, social housing, in my view, has got an absolutely fundamental role to play in terms of talking about poverty in this country. We don't build social houses anymore. Lots of other places do. We could do that. It is a choice and we have to pay for it. It would be the best investment we could make, in my view. Um, and you can't deal with poverty, given so much of poverty in this country is working poverty, if you're not talking about uh, more people supporting more people to work, helping people in work to stay working, and that means changing work in lots of different ways. Uh, and improving the quality of work. Uh, lots of people want to work very few hours because work is bloody miserable. Uh, and that is a massive problem. And we've seen that uh, as, across both genders. Uh, we've seen it for very, the lowest paid men uh, have seen a very significant reduction in hours. And we've done lots and lots of qualitative work with the, those groups. And time and time again, we get told stories about you know, working being really bad for their health. And it's not surprising people don't want to spend more of their life doing that if it's really bad for you. And that is something we could work on. But as Patricia has said, it's really hard. Uh, and, it's, and it's kind of slow, steady work. But there's, there's, that, there's lots in here on that agenda. So I've just tried to give you a, a flavour of that. But that's me talking. And you're not here to talk and listen to me. Um, I, I thought it was a really good question about business investment. And I don't know if um, Anton or Mary wants to pick up on that. Yeah, Anton, you go first. Okay. Well, and, and anything else that you want to jump in on? Yeah, I mean, I'll keep it, I'll keep it brief. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, as has been said, the UK has really suffered from very low business investment. Uh, for UK-based firms, uh, it, a lot of it is around making sure you have a, a stable environment around things like capital allowances, getting a clear line of sight. I think we need to look again at what we might be doing around intangible investment. Mary mentioned there's issues about how you measure investment. Some of it is not tangible physical assets. Some of it is intangibles. And, and, and how we, that is treated in tax. Around multinationals, well, it's a bit more complicated. Often it's there, it's about attracting FDI because often 
you know, their considerations are not as, as strictly based on, it's, uh, on, on, on these kind of issues. Uh, I would add one, one thing. I, I think we, we can look at what we can do more around complementary uh, investments. Mary mentioned earlier, we should look more about how we translate some of the fantastic research we've got. And again, whether there's something that could be done, not R&D tax credits, they're too, they're, 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 it's, 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 it's a bit too, too um, raw a measure. Something a bit more refined that could be done to, to support those companies that are drawing on, on new technologies. I'll just say one thing on growth sustainability. Look, I'm a big fan of, of, of the well-being agenda, of having a, you know, a framework. So as, you know, in Scotland, we've, we've been dealing with the national performance framework for some time, looking at well-being economy. But what you can't forget is that uh, increasingly, you know, the, we are decoupling from the carbon economy. I mean, and was shown in the presentation, if you do invest heavily, you could actually make that growth much more virtuous in terms of sustainability. And frankly, that's ultimately, GDP doesn't measure all economic activity, but it does actually ultimately tell you, because of the dependence on taxation, what's going to pay the bills, whether for public services or for that infrastructure. So we can't ignore it. We can't just say, let's, let's, let's have a shrinking economy. Otherwise, those inequality decisions are going to be really, really tough. Quite right. Uh, Mary? Yeah, and, and poor growth that we've seen in the last 15 years has translated to poor growth and living standards. Yeah. So we, we, can't, we can't get away from that. But as, um, as Anton says, we need to decouple that from the use of natural resources um, as quickly as, as we can. Um, on, on business investment, I completely agree again with, with what, what Anton said, that the definitions of um, investment are too narrow um, in terms mm -hmm. of what could be written off. More, more modern definitions of um, and tangible uh, investments um, need to happen so that they're, they're more incentivised. Um, and then there is the question about the role of public investment mm. um, as well. Um, the outlook for public investment right now is pretty horrific. Um, and, you know, treating all spending like it's the same uh, is, is obviously mad. So, um, you know, maybe there will be a change thereafter and the new government gets in. I, I, I certainly hope so for the long-term productive capacity of, of the economy. And just um, finally on the point about the third or voluntary sector. Yeah, Sarah's point. Yeah, yeah, completely, absolutely agree. We are doing a programme of work on this um, to try and capture the economic contribution of the third sector working with the ONS through our Economic Statistics Centre of Excellence. So absolutely agree and lots of people are interested in the work. Um, and we're trying to bring together all the researchers that are working on this across the UK to raise the profile of the, not just the contribution that the third voluntary civil society sector has, but also the economic <coughs> contribution it has, because it's absolutely massive. Thank you. Um, Charlie, do you want to say something about net zero on our report, and then we'll turn to Patricia. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, just wanted to pick up on the net zero, I guess, that we actually have made quite a bit of um, progress in terms of moving to cleaner energy, but I think the next uh, phase of the net zero transition is going to feel quite different, um, where it's going to affect kind of our everyday lives, if that's uh, your greener homes or, or your greener uh, vehicles. And we've done quite a bit of thinking on uh, the first of those, on what it would actually mean to um, have more efficient homes uh, and you know we shouldn't we shouldn't overplay um, or underestimate just how much yeah. a faff it is for people just to have to come in and, and it's like that's retrofitting your homes or or improving the insulation in, in, in your loft so that's going to be a really big change um, at the same time it's going to be it's going to be expensive uh, I need to think about who covers the costs of that next phase of um, trans the transition uh, one of the, the recommendations that we've made is there should be some kind of sliding scale in terms of uh, the energy of, uh, uh, improvements to your home depending on the sort of income that you've got so i guess you know, made lots of progress on net zero um but the next phase is going to be really big disruption to our everyday lives we've done well on the easy bit and got absolutely nowhere on the hard bit that's the uh, in, a, in a nutshell uh, patricia uh, are you any thoughts on if you wanted to pick up on the health and sort of work yeah, I, I, I might pick up on the, both the poverty and the well-being yeah. question. So we know that, that um, well-being and job quality are inextricably related. The, 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 people, the workers across Europe with the lowest levels of job quality have the lowest reported well-being. So mm. it fundamentally, fair work and, and investing in fair work is a well-being strategy. It's good for people's physical and mental health. It's 
good for their physical, their, their financial prosperity, not just when they're in work, but actually beyond work, so the kind of provision that they get for retirement. So we've had a long narrative in the UK about work should pay, um, but we know, and we know that the, for, for most people, not for all, but for most people, the biggest single um, action you take to get out of poverty is either you get a job or you get a better job. Um, and so, so the, the importance of accessing work, but accessing good work, is actually crucial to poverty. But we've ended up in a position where we have really high levels of in-work poverty. So people are recognising that work doesn't pay, and the kind of things that Gavin outlined, which is that people will um, step back from work or take different decisions in relation to work because of that. Um, I was chatting to somebody the other day. It's, it's an anecdotal example, but not, I don't think, useless. On the basis of that, somebody who wanted to, a young man from the East End, wanted to do an apprenticeship. If if you do if you your apprenticeship is paid wage for age you earn about four sixty five an mm. hour, um, you would be better to work in Tesco's because they'll pay you the minimum wage uh, after a period of time and not age related. If you come from a poor household, your option on investing in your future and including your future financial well being is severely limited mm -hmm. by having to work for four sixty five an hour because you you have responsibilities to a wider family. So we've got this whole issue around work paying and the narrative of work paying has I think been shown to be very inaccurate but it's also been very destructive politically because yeah. I think some of the very difficult and challenging ideas we've seen are about people feeling really distanced from the labour market and let me make one one more point it's really important to our economy it, that we can get people to stay economically active and actually that well-being becomes crucial to that so if we invest in better jobs where people can work potentially older um, but maybe in different forms, not working all the time, where we can encourage people who have long-term health conditions or disabilities to be in work, many of whom want to be in work but can't access work that allows them to fit their health and work requirements. If we can do that, if we can design jobs and employment better, we're likely to be able to keep people, get people into economic activity and keep them there far longer. And that's an economic benefit to everybody as well as a social benefit. Right. I, I'd like to go on, but we're kind of. We've, I think we're probably going to be trying on your goodwill because we have already overrun, and uh, I promised our panel and everybody else we'd, we'd try and keep to time. So I think I'm going to call it a day there. Um, I hope we've given you a, a, at least a taste of what we've been up to. Um, uh, I'd like to thank uh, all our speakers, uh, who I think have all been brilliant. Um, I'd like to also thank our partners. Uh, uh, Mary and University of Strathclyde for like organising this uh, event. I'd actually like to thank my colleague Emma, who did all the hard work for putting the event on. He's an absolute star, uh, and all of you for turning out and having this discussion. Um, don't leave without the book. Uh, do have a look at it. Um, we're hoping you might see some of it slowly over time come into practice in the years ahead. Fingers crossed. All right. Thank you very much.